Hi, I'm Matt Harrison, President of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Blessed Holy Week to all of you. Thank you so much for all the cards and letters and emails. I must have got a thousand of them from you about the testimony in D.C. It was my pleasure to make that testimony on behalf of the whole church for the sake of religious freedom. And even though it has been twisted and turned and still continues even to this moment in the media, the Lord will bless all things. Count on that. He will bless all things. So, for Holy Week, I want to share something with you. Mark's Gospel. It's really an interesting gospel. It's brief. But what is most interesting is that virtually everybody in the gospel, except God and the demons, gets Jesus wrong. So uh, I'll just walk you through this briefly. At the baptism of Jesus, a voice comes from heaven, you are my beloved son. God the Father knows who Jesus is. But then Jesus heals the man with the unclean spirit. Everybody's astonished. Where does this authority come from? They don't know who he is. Jesus continues to heal. Jesus does not permit the demons to speak because they know who he is in Mark chapter 1. Then in chapter 2, he heal, heals the paralytic. And uh, they get very upset with him when he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. They say, this is blasphemy. They don't know who Jesus is. In chapter 3, he's even, Jesus for healing is even said to be possessed by the devil chapter 3, verse 22. Then he goes to his hometown in Nazareth, and they don't recognize him. Who are my mother and brothers? They were trying to pull him back and get him into his right mind, so they thought. His family doesn't even know who he is. Chapter 4, Jesus calms the storm. Who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? His disciples can't figure out quite who he is. Then the demons, of course, uh, know him. Jesus heals the man with a demon and the demon says, Son of God most high, I adjure you, do not torment me. And he sends him into the pigs. And then after that man goes and reports that he'd been healed, everybody from town comes out and says, Oh, I don't, we don't know who you are, Jesus, but get out of here, please. Chapter 4, verse 17. Then chapter 6, Jesus is rejected in Nazareth. Is this not the carpenter's son, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph? They don't know who he is. Then when King Herod gets information about what Jesus had been doing, he thinks Jesus is John the baptizer raised from the dead. Jesus walks on water and they say, who is this? He says, take heart, it is I. And they were utterly astonished. Then in chapter eight, we see a very interesting glimpse of the truth of who Jesus is, but still not completely perceived. Peter confesses Jesus. Jesus says, who do people say that I am? Some say Elijah, some say the pro one of the prophets, some say John the baptizer. But Jesus says, but you, who do you say that I am? And then Peter says, but thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Great, you've answered well, Jesus tells him. But then right away, Jesus makes his first passion prediction. He says, I'm going up to Jerusalem and I'm going to be killed. And then Peter confronts him and says, no, this can't be. And Jesus makes the most intense, intense rebuke of the entire New Testament to Peter, chief of the apostles. Get behind me, Satan. You don't think the things of God, but the things of men. They get him wrong in chapter 10. Jesus wants the children to come to him and they forbid them. The rich young man gets him wrong. What can I do to inherit eternal life? James and John get him wrong. Hey, when you come into your kingdom, we want the seats of power and authority. The triumphal entry. Can you imagine? Just the Sunday before the Passion, Jesus marches into Jerusalem, hailed as the son of David, and the same crowds would soon turn on him. Then in chapter 11, his authority is questioned. How is it you're doing these miracles? By whose authority? 
all the way to chapter 14. And the chief priests and scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. Then Judas betrays Jesus. A lot of people say that Judas maybe was disappointed that Jesus wasn't coming forward with his messiahship more readily. And this goes on all the way to something extraordinary at the end of the gospel. Jesus is delivered to Pilate. Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? You have said so. And yet Pilate then proceeds to kill him. The crowds cry out, crucify him. Jesus is mocked by the soldiers. Hail, King of the Jews. And then something happens in Mark 15. Do you remember, Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It would appear that Jesus himself doesn't even know who he is. And yet that's not so. Jesus is praying this verse, second verse, I believe, of Psalm 22. And the whole psalm is a messianic psalm about the necessity of the Christ suffering for the sins of the world. And then when Jesus is there hanging dead on the cross, that first Good Friday, three o'clock in the afternoon, the centurion who had witnessed it all and also participated in putting him to death, the centurion says, truly this man was the Son of God. The centurion is the first one in the gospel who comes to understand who Jesus is in death. We call this the theology of the cross. God reveals himself in suffering. My dear friends, all things work together for good. When you suffer, when you face many challenges in this world, remember, God's own Son went before you to suffer and die for you. And just at that moment, when he was abandoned by the apostles, persecuted and crucified, everybody thought, those who had believed in him thought, this is the end. This is the worst thing that could possibly happen. All of our hope is over. God hates him. And yet precisely at that moment, God was doing what he proposed to do from the foundation of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was the greatest act of God in all of history to send his son to die. You and I know the resurrection and we celebrate Holy Week knowing full well we have the resurrection. Know this too, when you suffer, in life and we see many Good Fridays and Holy Saturdays in this life, don't we? How often our hopes are killed and our dreams are dashed and buried. Yet we should know that right in the midst of those things, just as God sent His Son to die and that death appeared to be caused by evil men and ignorant people, Nevertheless, Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It was God's perfect intent that Jesus be put to death. And that was for good. You should know also that when you suffer, it is for good. Luther quipped that in this life, we often see nothing but the devil's rear end. And wow, is that ever true? I've experienced that personally over the last number of weeks since testifying on Capitol Hill. And yet, Luther made that commentary on the book of Genesis and the story of Joseph, where he told his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And so it goes with you. All things work together for good. We know that because Jesus died for us and he rose again. Blessed Holy Week.